everyone, I am Ms. Makwetu. I will be taking you for History 114 in Alice, and Prof. Ulrich will be taking you for History 114E in East London. You can contact us via Blackboard Messenger, or you can come consult with us during our consultation hours. Our group consultations will be in person at the Green Auditorium on Mondays at 2 p.m. Please see your learning guide. Our group consultations have been outlined there. And to prepare for your test, please take notes as you listen. Please read your slides, the slides of the lecture, and do the readings that have been uploaded on Blackboard. This lecture is going to be looking at the Khoisan of the Kalahari and the Mbuti of the Ituri Forest. There's also going to be a film that I'm going to need um, for you guys to watch. Um, you will see the film at the end of the lecture. Please do watch the film um, before our consultation by the end of this week. Please watch the film before our first group consultation, which is on Monday. Um, it will form part of that group discussion and um, there may be test questions from the video. So, the Kang of the Kalahari. So for 99% of human history, all people were gatherers and hunters. They lived in small flexible bands, depending on a vast and intimate knowledge of their environment. Before people learned to cultivate crops and domesticate animals, they relied heavily on nature. People shared the resources they had hunted and gathered. There was no rich, there was no poor, People shared and helped each other. Keeping alive was intrinsically linked to sharing. The San people, known as the Kang, are a group of what were once called African Bushmen. Bushmen is a name given to them by the Dutch who settled in South Africa in the 17th century. Africanists, however, now prefer the term San, which means original settlers. The Khoisan of the Kalahari are descendants of an ancient foraging community. The Khoisan Obasara of the, are the original modern human inhabitants of southern Africa. They range from Namibia to Botswana and parts of South Africa. Most of the Kang live in Namibia and Botswana. So due to the seasonality of both game and food um, sources, they are nomadic. They live in small bands that are made up of related families between 15 to 40 men and women. The group um, composition is not, it was not stable over time, nor was it territorial, nor organized by any rigid kinship criterion. Instead, group size and mobility were determined by the availability of water, game, and food, and the wishes of individuals to go visit other groups or become part of other groups. Hunter-gatherers um, lived in groups because there was safety in numbers. Several family units would live in the same group. They chose their location based on the available food. Um, if they weren't enough animals to hunt or enough food together, the entire group had to move to an area where food was more plentiful. The next slide is going to show us the location of the Kang. As you can see, the shaded area consists of major Kang related people. The area where the San, among others, live is shown in the, in the red. Now we're going to look at the historical background. The San are descendants of the first people who ever lived here before black or white people migrated into the region. So archaeologists tend to agree that the San are the descendants of the original Homo sapiens who occupied South Africa at least 150,000 years ago. Genetics say that the oldest gene pattern among modern human is that of the Khoisan. It dates back to about 80,000 years ago. 
all other peoples on the planet, Europeans, Black Africans, Asians, North and South Americans, Australians, are all descendants from this original gene type. The Khoisan are believed to be the oldest residents of Africa among the surviving peoples. The group dispersed before the invasion of Europeans in Southern Africa. Since the 17th century, when Holland colonized the Cape as a transit point for the Indies trade, the Khoisan were forced to withdraw inland. So when South Africa became a useful colony for the colonizers, they went north in search of more land and living space and then driving the Khoisan into the interior. Now, the Khoisan found themselves caught between the Bantu and the colonizers and this forced them into the Kalahari. The hunter-gatherers often moved away or were absorbed by intermarriage or some of them were often killed off. This map shows us the present day Khoisan. They can be divided lingu linguistically into three large dialect groups, the Northern, the Central, and the Southern. So among the so-called Northern Khoisan are the Kang, who live around Etchopan in Southwest Africa, on and near the frontier of Southwest Africa and Botswana are, the, are, are such groups such as the Zun to the north and the Ao who occupy a lateral zone reaching as far as Ganzi. Although each of these various geographically distinct northern sand groups has its own name, they all speak the same language. Kang and all have other striking similarities such as in kins kinship structure. Now we're going to look at foraging among the Kang. So labor is divided, the men hunt and make tools, and the women gather and they cook. But the men sometimes will help in the um, gathering. Men can go off on their own or in twos to inspect traps, hunt things like spring hair, or search for larger game that must be brought down with a bow and an arrow. The hunters use spears, bows, and arrows with tips of weak poison. The points are coated with poison. The points that are coated with poison are detachable. Whenever the Kang go out, he has a leather bag over his shoulders. As long as he has poison in his arrows, he is therefore ready to shoot whenever a target appears. The main animals that they hunt are the kudu, the eland, wildebeest, and giraffes. They also rely on small game such as porcupine. The men butcher the animal and they let it dry. They let the meat dry in the sun so it keeps so that it, they can keep it for a longer time. They make fire using sticks, um, zebra dung, and soft grass from the bush belt. So with the large kills, the men will, go, will not go hunting until the meat hanging from the branch is finished. The sand do not accumulate more than what they need. The woman, with the digging, the women dig up roots, they gather berries and leaves and pick nuts. They use digging sticks um, and carrying bags. They also collect things like termites, caterpillars, and locusts. In many ways, the gathering of plant food um, was actually more reliable than hunting. The women rarely gather alone. They move in groups. The women usually set up the camp in a spot with desired plants. The pattern of hunting and gathering activities varies greatly with the season and the type of food sought. In the summer, the Bushmen will go out in the cool morning and evening. In the winter, they will go out in the midday when it is warmer. The women build a large cooking fire, but the men will actually help with the gathering um, of the firewood. 
The group's strategy for obtaining food, and in fact, they are, their whole entire social organization was adapted for survival in the Kalahari. So to the, uns, uh, to the outsider, or some, with, to someone with an untrained eye, the bush felt is a beautiful, natural place, but to the sand, the wild bush is rich and abundant with food. The Sam could hunt more than 60 animal species, ranging in the size from hare to buffalo. The woman recognized more than 100 edible plant species, collecting a dozen varieties in a day. It is rare to find surface water in the Kalahari. The Khoisan's migration is controlled by water. So at times when surface water is unavailable, the Khoisan's main source of water is in the vegetables, specifically the melons and the tubers. What keeps the sun alive is what the women gather. Melons alone could not keep the people alive. Their lives depend as they always have on what women could gather. On their knowledge of the plants, on their eyes that see these tiny vines, and their strong arms that are able to dig up these roots that are tugged deep in the sand which, which store water. In the next picture, you can see um, sand women digging. So when the sand get thirsty, they will lay down on the ground next to a bush and dig deep into the ground with a stick. Then they will pull out the roots and they will cut it into pieces and that will be shared among amongst the group. When we look at property, hunting territory is open to anyone within the band, however, however other bands um, can cross it. Water holes are owned by each band, but neighboring bands may use them with the permission from the band, which is always granted. Arrows may be owned by anyone, and part of the game is owned by the person whose arrow first entered the animal. So foraging, foraging families own the food that they have gathered. We're going to look at now the Kang system of values. The ethic of sharing formed the core of the self-described Kang system of values. The Kang do a lot of sharing. Sharing is key to understanding how they live and how they survive in the sparse Kalahari environment. After a successful hunt, the Kang will share their game. The meat is owned to be given away. The giving away um, of a kill draws people together beyond satisfying human hunger. Um, and it also confirms kinship ties. So if there was a large kill, it would be shared outside the immediate family, which was a sound survival strategy. A hunter who killed a large antelope or the like would be hard pressed, even with the help of his wife and children. He would have to share the meat by distributing his meat. The hunter ensured that the recipients would be obliged to return the favor sometime in the future. So we can see that reciprocity was delayed so that one partner would always be in debt to the other. Reciprocity relationships would include individuals who purposefully select gift-giving partners from a distant territory. Presumably, it was hoped that a partner would have something to offer when goods were difficult to obtain locally. For the Kang, security was obtained by giving rather than hoarding. That is by accumulating obligations that could be claimed in times of need. So sharing was a form of social insurance. The head of a household may plan ahead to make a substantial gift to someone who is an owner at another water hall to protect against the possibility that one's own water hall may go dry. During the winter, or some other future time. 
so the household may then be forced to ask for permission to live at the other band's water hole. The Kang believe in the ethics of sharing even with those who struggled to find food. Eventually, even the one who does not have meat will eventually bag an animal in the future and they will share it and that other band may need it the most at that time. It's like a future investment. So the Kang had no leaders. They were headless foraging groups. When there were disagreement between band, mem band members, the band system was very fluid. People could put, up, put a distance between each other or they could readily go join another band. So now we're going to look at egalitarianism, egalitarianism among the Kang. So egalitarianism marks Kang relations. So an egalitarian society is a society that believes that all people are equally important and should have the same rights and opportunities in life. So when a man kills a large animal, he will actually face a ridicule within the Kang um, society. The band members will do something that's called insulting their meat. They ridicule the, the value of the game. They do this so that when a young man kills an animal, he does not think of himself as above the rest or thinks of himself as a chief or a big man. They do this to keep everyone humble. They speak of the meat as being worthless to prevent pride from taking control. This is an active suppression of any social inequalities that may arise. The Kang are very well aware of inequalities, so they refuse to be dominated by one man. After a hunt, the Kang hunters will come, the hunters will come back and they will tell the band the story of the hunt. They will sit together, tell the story of the hunting experience. This is this also find this also further binds the group together in a common experience. Sometimes the Kang would, would have someone who composes music in the group and the songs would celebrate the day-to-day -day events that happen within the band and in the hunter-gathering life. And these stories of knowledge, culture and values were passed down orally through storytelling and song. When we look at conflict resolution, most individuals do not support either disputants when something happens. They give, the, they give time for the argument to cool down. The Dobekan have been known to enter into disputes usually about women. Now we're going to look at the social changes and developments. When we look at the Kang in the 1960s, they were still living by hunting and gathering most of the time. In 1963, the San planted no crops. They kept no domesticated animals except for the hunting dog. The majority of the people lived mainly by hunting and gathering. Now, 1967, the still great majority, they, they still get a great majority of their calories from the hunting and gathering but there are many kinds of social changes occurring since 1969. Most of the men of the Dobe area at some point in their lives have had some experience herding the Bantu cattle. At any one time, about 20% of the young men were working with the cattle. Many had learned the techniques by assisting their Bantu neighbors in planting in years of good rainfall, some had planted and harvested small plots themselves. There have been herders, there, there have been herders, agriculturists, miners and travelers through the Kalahari Desert over the past millennium and before that. It was not until about 1980 when the Klangwa area was incorporated into the Botswana state that the Kang were considered ex-hunters. They had lived by gardening and herding small animals, selling crafts, wel welfare payments, and incorporated into wage labor. The Kang relied on the Herero and the Tswana cattle owners for work, food, and income. Sometimes the cattle owners would offer them opportunities to come live with them at the cattle posts. During the 
during 1967 to 1969 era, the Kang would actually occasionally go visit relatives at these cattle posts and they would share meals with them of these domesticated animals before returning to the bush. Families of those who were aged, those who were sick, those who were handicapped found it difficult to return to the bush, so they deliberately ended up moving to the cattle posts. The Kang were no, lo no longer living in their traditional living groups. They were also now living close to permanent water holes. And this, as you can imagine, changed um, the bush camp. So in 1960 to 1961, a government settlement station had been set up by South Africans at Chumkwe, 50 kilometers west of the Dobe areas. But this had barely begun to affect the lives of the Petunialand Kang. In 1964, after the first census of the area, the Kang were canvassed in a voter registration drive, this being one of their first direct contacts with the central government of the country. In 1965, the Dobe area San voted in their first election, along with their fellow countrymen, citizens of the Independent Republic of Botswana in 1966. The previously unguarded international border that runs through the Dobe area was fenced and began to be patrolled regularly by the South African occupation forces in Namibia. This fencing limited access to the western hunting areas of the Dobe area and in the mid-1960s a number of Dobe area families actually decided to emigrate permanently to Tumpwe, where the South Africans were providing jobs and rations. So now in 1967, a trade store was built at Kangwa in the heart of the Dobe area. And for the first time, store-bought food and dry goods were available for cash. The sand woman of Kangwa immediately set up thriving businesses in home, um, they would bring beer from their homes using brown sugar from the store as the main ingredient. The arrival of the store and the increase in government services after 1966 reduced how the Dobe area had been isolated. In 1967, 1968, an average of one truck a week arrived at Kangwa from, out, from the outside world. This improvement now in transportation made it much easier for the Dobe area San to travel out. In the years 1964 to 1968, about 20 young men and went to work in the gold mines of the Witwatersrand in South Africa. The San planted and harvested extensive crops of maize, sorghum and melon. Now something interesting happens in, in 1972 to 1973. When the rainfall failed, the sand fell back on hunting and gathering. So the sand, as we can see, have been, they, they've been getting money from the mine wages, the payment of herding cattle. So now more and more goats, donkeys, horses, cattle came into the sand community by the dozens. They're herding animals now. And in 1973, a school opened at Kangwa, and the South African military were recruiting the San as trackers in their border patrols against African liberation movements. In recent years, governments of both Namibia and Botswana have forced Kang bands to vacate their lands. In 2002, a group was expelled from their land to make way for a game reserve. And some of the men were arrested for hunting in the reserve and imprisoned for two years. So now we're going to look at the Kang's cultural transition. So when Botswana became an independent nation in 1966, the new government began to encourage the keeping of livestock and the development of agriculture. For example, they gave donkeys to the Kang for pulling simple plows. There was a routine purchase of traditional 
handcrafts such as beads, necklaces, thereby they were introducing money into the community. Later, when the Kang in Namibia were brought into the South African army, the Kang received more infusions of cash and goods, mainly also via interaction with their kin. So now, with the influx of money and supplies, the Kang beca became hoarders, and some had metal, metal trunks in their huts, and this in turn limited their mobility. We can see here in this image, a Kang couple with a trunk um, full of items that have been accumulated. This is by 1976. Um, the hoarding of goods played a role in their transformation. They were no longer able to move around. They lost mobility. The Kang boys became less interested in living as their fathers had. They no longer wished to hunt and so no longer tried to learn the traditional ways. Instead, they preferred the easier task of herding. The houses of the Kang became semi-permanent. They were made up of a mud, they were, became mud huts. The lack of mobility brought in more changes. The Kang now looked to their, neighboring, to their neighbors, the Bantu chiefs, for arbitration when conflict ar arose. So they moved away from their old ways of um, handling disputes. This meant the decline of autonomy and the Kang increased their reliance on an incorporation into the Bantu society. The mar marriage of Kang women to Bantu men became common. The children of these unions obtained full rights within the Bantu system, including the right to inherit livestock. They were more likely to think themselves um, of now as being Bantu. They became scattered, others lost their knowledge, they knew about the desert. The Kalahari became more of a cattle country. The sand water holes were taken over by commercial ranches. Now we're going to go back to what I said earlier that we're going to look at the origins of the term Bushmen. So Bushmen, Bush, Bushimans, Bushismans has been in use since the 1680s. The most likely origin is from the term Busisman, meaning bandit or outlaw. Only much later was its meaning restricted to people, restricted the, to pe the people um, called Bushmen today. The Dutch dictionary published in 1902 said that the word meant one who lives in the bushes, but has, it has also been applied to um, the orangutans. The term is not only considered racist, but it's also sexist. So what do you think of the term? Do you think it's acceptable? And is it okay to use the term? Would it be okay to use it just because the Khoisan use it? What do you think? So the Jew Ansi in Namibia decided that although the term was problematic, they would use Bushmen because everyone knows to whom it refers. Some Khoisan in Botswana use the term to show their relationship to the bush. In other words, to their land, which is of utmost importance to them. So the preferred term is Khoisan. In Botswana, the common word is Basarwa. The narrow bushmen of Botswana favor the term Naokwe, which means red people to distinguish themselves from the black people. It was adopted in the early 1990s by the Bushmen organization, First People of the Kalahari. Another term used is simply Kwe, meaning people. Most people prefer the use of the names of their particular groups. These terms are derived from the language of the Khoisan and are the most appropriate terms to use. Now we're going to conclude for the Bushmen, for the Khoisan um, section. So in the past, the Kang had no concept of accumulating personal wealth. There was cooperation and collective values within the band. Both men and women would take part in key um, decisions. Everyone was part of the decision-making process. 
They had either they had neither government nor codified laws. They managed their affairs um, without government of all these laws. There was reciprocity in the distribution of food. Reciprocity appeared to be the force that holds the band together. And this reciprocity also just made sure that no one, you know, starves or no one goes without water or food. The last part of our lecture is going to be looking at the Mbuti of the Ituri forest, who are hunter-gatherers in the Ituri forest. So the Mbuti are one of the few remaining hunting and gathering peoples in the world. The Mbuti live in the, Utu, in the Ituri forest of the Congo. So the Mbuti have been in the forest for many thousands of years. They are among the oldest inhabitants of Africa. They may well be the original inhabitants of the great tropical rainforest, which stretches nearly from coast to coast. Over here, this image shows us the image of a Mbuti forest camp. The second image shows us men, Mbuti men, carrying their hunting nets and their spears. Um, they are returning to their huts in the Ituri forest, northeast of Zaire. So the ancient Egyptians called the Mbuti the dancers of God and as dwellers in the land of trees. So now the earliest recording of the Mbuti is a record of an expedition sent from Egypt in the fourth dynasty, some 2,500 years before the Christian era to discover the source of the Nile. In the tomb of the Pharaoh Nefikar is preserved the report of his commander Herku who entered a great forest to the west of the mountains of the moon and discovered there are people of the trees. Later records show that the Egyptians had become relatively familiar with the Mbuti, who were evidently living all those thousands of years back, just where they are living today. So the distribution of the Mbuti in the Ituri forest so Chebesta, who is a cultural anthropologist, divides the Mbuti, whom he calls Bambuti, into three major groups. He divides them into the Aka in the north, Sao in the south, and Efe in the east. The Efe hunt primarily with bows and arrows. The Sao, who unlike the Efe, are net hunters. We have then two distinct groups, the Efe Mbuti, the archers of the southeastern Ituri forest, and the Sao Mbuti, the net hunter of the Ipuli district. We have a map here showing the distribution of the Mbuti. The boundary also shows us the section of the Ituri forest used by the Mbuti. You can see the keys up there, and if you follow those keys onto the map, you'll see the Sao, the net hunters in the Ipulu district. You'll see the Efe, the archers, and you'll see the boundary of the Ituri forest. The division of the Ituri Mbuti into Aka, Efe, and Sao is a linguistic classification. And at that, a division not according to Mbuti languages, but to the villagers who live around them. We have presented two groups, not only linguistically and territorially distinct, but also they are distinguished by hunting techniques. Okay, so now we're going to look at the habitation. So a camp consists of one hut per family, the huts are built by the woman in just the same shape and manner as by all Iturimbuti. In a circle with doors facing towards the center, 
Each woman regards this as part of the camp as her property. A woman will build as many as 300 huts in her lifetime. There are no bachelor huts or huts for unmarried girls or widows and no ritual structures. The relations of the huts to one another in the circle is dictated as much as anything by the friendship of the woman. If the women are not getting along or someone has a dislike or grudge, they would alter the direction the hut is facing. The size of these hunting bands varies. Among the archers, let's say from 3 to 37 huts, the net hunters tend to be larger bands, averaging around 15 hunts, 15 huts per hut hunting band. The particular Ipulu band to be considered, considered was an exceptionally large and fluid one, in itself varying from 10 to 30 huts. In practice, it often became two hunting bands. The Mbuti move from camp to camp every two to three weeks. When they leave, they will abandon a hut. The leaves, the branches um, will fall away and they will rot away and decompose, returning back to the soil. So economic life. So hunting and gathering is the basis of the Mbuti economy. The most important activity of the Mbuti men is the hunt. The men prepare a special poison for the arrows. The arrows are a principal hunting tool. Hunting is a principal mean by which the Mbuti villager relationship is maintained. Food quest is the day-to-day -day economy. Hunting for the Mbuti is a full-time job. A group of five to six hunters may be able to bring back an antelope each day or may fail completely for days on end. Elephant hunting takes place only among the Mbuti who use spears. The hunting of elephants seems to feature in the 19th century. The elephant hunting was an answer to the needs of the villagers whose plantations were continually being destroyed by elephants. So they would encourage the Mbuti to kill the elephants off. In the early days, the villagers had little use for the task other than for bar cloth beaters. Ivory trade was introduced by the Arab traders in the 19th century. So ivory became a most precious commodity and the Mbuti were encouraged to kill elephants. This was further intensified by, early colon by the early colonial period. So for the Mbuti, killing an, element, uh, killing an animal as big as an elephant means having meat that's going to last them for days and days. In the Ituri forest, rubber and ivory once comprised major forest products for export. Rubber was collected by the forced labor of the Bantu and Sudanic villagers. Ivory was supplied by the Mbuti as well as by the villagers elephant hunting. When the Mbuti killed an elephant, um, they would literally take their camp, move it to where the elephant is. Um, also, they would also bring back the task to the village in exchange for salt, tobacco, cloths, and agricultural food from the from the villages. Here I have an image that shows us ivory and rubber being weighed at a post on the Ituri River. Um, Congo was actually in the top five rubber producing states on the African continent. Okay, so we've already said that, that um, when they've killed an elephant, they will move the entire camp to the elephant. They will abandon the camp and build a new camp where they um, have killed the elephant. The Mbuti point out that this is easier than bringing the elephant to the camp. Um, there will be no hunting for a week. This will be accompanied by lots of celebrations, singing, dancing. So next, we are going to look at the infiltration of commodity economy in the Mbuti society. So recent studies suggest that the Mbuti contact with the Bantu or Sudanic cultivator dates back to a much earlier time than formerly thought. 
possibly more than a thousand years ago. There are villages who live around the Mbuti. The villages are amongst the plantations in the, in the great clearings cut from the heart of the Ituri forest. The Bantu and Sudanic seldom go into the forest. They have their own superstitions about the forest. The villagers have fear. They see it as a dangerous, dark place with ghosts, with spirits. So um, in the villages, you will sometimes find some booty, but they are scorned by the booty who have remained in the forest and have refused to be settled. The Mbuti live in a symbiotic relationship with the villagers. There is a mutually beneficial relationship between the two groups. The relationship is based on exchange. It was the ivory trade that first brought the Mbuti into contact with the world market. The ivory trade was first introduced to the area by the Arab traders in the latter half of the 19th century and was intensified by Europeans during the period of the Congo Free State and the early colonial period. The Mbuti supply the villages with meat and with certain food forest products, such as roofing leaves or lianas in return for plantation products, such as hoes, spears, and arrows that are used, and actually also some veg vegetables. Trade is not something that is necessary as the Mbuti can easily revert to their nomadic ways. The trading between the Mbuti and the villages is actually one of mutual convenience. The hunting dog is the only domesticated animal that the Mbuti keep. The hunting dog is traded from the villages. The dogs are mute and the Mbuti will make bells and put them around the dog's neck so that they can also hear the dog when they've gone hunting its whereabouts. Now we're going to look at the political life of the Mbuti. So there are no leaders, there are no chiefs, there are no councils or any other formal governing bodies in the Mbuti camp. The Mbuti have respect for age and experience. The opinions of the old and wise is heeded. Lineage elders may appear to become headmen of chieftains of Mbuti bands, representing the band to the village or the chief. As mentioned above, the authority of the elder derives from his age by virtue of which he represents the lineage ancestors. The district hunted by the band, together with all the vegetables and animal food contained, is that district and raw materials used in the, sorry, the district hunted by the band, together with all the vegetable and animal food contained in that district and the raw materials using the Mbuti technology, is the collective property of the band. All members of the band share equal rights. So now we're going to look at the relationship between the bands. There are informal relationships that exist between the bands. These connections are made through family visits to other bands. The Mbuti will sometimes attend each other's dances, and that is where they will find suitable partners to marry. Members are linked through grandparents, parents, siblings, and children, and are all band members and related members of different bands. All Mbuti are in a fundamentally kinship-based relationship. To them, relatives and friends are everywhere in the Mbuti camp. Now we're going to look at the term pygmies. why it's problematic. So sometimes academic texts will refer to the um, Mbuti as pygmies. This word has its origins in the Greek word pygmy, meaning a cubit or measure of about 13 inches, which according to Greek mythology was the size of a race of dwarfs. In Latin, the word assumed a more modern recognizable, recognizable form Pygmy. This word came to be applied as a generic reference to a various Western African peoples such as the Mbuti. The term refers to a person's physical appearance, meaning small. In biology, it is used to refer to small species. In English, it has been used to mark by 
describing someone as having a pygmy mind, and so this insults the intellectual capabilities. It has a history of being used as a derogatory term to insult someone who is not liked. These are some of the reasons the term is problematic. Sometimes the word is simply used as a non-specific derogatory word. Do you think the use of this word depends on what is meant or who is using it? Is it acceptable to use this term? Just think about that. Okay. So now we are going to conclude on the Mbuti. So the Mbuti have no chiefs, no formal councils. Maintenance of the law was a cooperative affair. People cooperated with each other to produce the means of livelihood without either, without either bowing before a great leader or engaging in an endless strife with each other. The men and the women were free to decide how they wanted to spend their day. There was no private land ownership. Decisions were made by consensus at fire camps. Food is shared among the um, band members. Now we're going to look at the similarities and differences. Both groups rely heavily on gathering. They get 60 to 80% of their food through gathering. Gathering is a woman's work and hunting is a man's job, although men will pick and eat when they are hunting or will pick to bring to the camp while hunting. Both groups have been displaced by oppression. The Khoisan have been forcibly evicted from the Kalahari by the Botswana government to pursue diamond mining. The Mbuti have fled to refugee camps due to militias in the forest. Some Mbuti still live in the Ituri forest and practice traditional ways. There's a small group of Khoisan that remain in the Kalahari but have had to make certain changes that, uh, that adopt modern living, whereas Mbuti still um, are hunter-gatherers living in the Ituri forest and thrive without government. So what have we learned? So dependence on wild food resources was the way humans acquired food for the vast stretch of human history. Everything that humans had during the period was basically the product of natural materials gathered from the land. This has helped us understand early human cultures. You can see how foraging cultures have changed over time. You can see the process of how hunter-gatherers interacted with food producers through trade and other exchanges that occurred. Moreover, how hunter-gatherers share some traits, but how they are also quite uniquely different to each other and also very important why the term bushmen and pygmies has been considered to be problematic the last thing will be our film this will be a film by john marshall that he did um in the 50s he documented the kung and their shift from being a foraging community to agriculture. Please do watch the movie before our group consultation on Monday. And thank you for attending this lecture.